Namaste and in La Catch. I'm Zen Benefiel, your host for One World, and welcome to this edition. I'm not going to go into reframing those phrases. You're going to have to find those on your own. They're really cool, and I suggest you use them in your life because they really make a difference. So this episode, we're going to be entertained by Dr. Terrence Johnson, who is the co-founder of iProgress. He's a writer, a public speaker, an innovator, a licensed professional counselor, and a former professor at Mississippi College. And he's got a doctorate in counseling. He's also got a master's in science counseling, or a master of science in counseling. Um, so he's going to be a really interesting character to speak with today. Terrence, glad to have you here. Glad, uh, look, glad to have the invite and be on your program. So, look, I, I appreciate it. <laughs> Well, it's exciting to talk to people like you that, that have a rich life that can share stories and, and really provide details of, of the integration and the inspiration and the, uh, and all those kinds of things that make it real, right? Yeah. Because if we can think one thing, but unless we make it real, it really doesn't matter. It's like dreaming, right? Right. <laughs> Dream, uh, goals are dreams with deadlines, they say. Right. right. So, you know, we, we launch into a lot of different areas of development and inspiration and insight and investigation into how others have experienced their inner development initially in life and what they've been able to do with that long term in their professional lives as well. So without any further ado, how did you find your uh, initial connection and what was that like what were we at in life um so i guess i go two points so one point i think with the first half of my career i think being a helper that came naturally to me uh, mm -hmm. i tell people people have always talked to me all my life um would just come up and tell me things about them. Like even when I was little, like adults would just come in <laughs> to me. I was like, I don't know what you want me to do with this, but people just felt comfortable talking to me. Uh, and I realized that um, there was a reason for that. I didn't know my role in it, but I just knew it was something that I needed to do with it. Uh, but also, I've always been somebody that enjoyed stories. Like, my mom would tell you, even when I was little, I, I used to read the newspaper at, like, two years old or something. I just loved to read. And I carried that all throughout my life. I was, like, the the book festival, like, number one customer. Like, <laughs> like the book Like the bar says, right? You know, reading is essential. Right. And I loved it. Um, I think one of my favorite books was James and the Giant Peach. Mm. And it's like, I was reading it and I could see it, you know, I could see like all that stuff visually. And I like, I love, love films. I love images. And so I think for me, one of the guiding images for me is the crossroads. And so I think for the inner part of me, that came around maybe six years ago. And that was when I was kind of doing a shift from i was just bad at taking care of myself okay. <laughs> like a lot of people well was this a, a, a shift to the inner or just a, a final recognition that yeah that part of your life has been there i think both but i think for at the time what was going on like my dad was sick for a number of years so i was taking care of him mm -hmm. but also i was shifting out of a role of like being a professor and doing that and trying to see like what was next or what was my next you know assignment to do in life and uh, I started doing nature walks and I think that ties back to like when I was growing up I was a boy scout and it was oh there you me. go there you go <laughs> like, did, so it, did you make it to eagle scout I didn't make it. I was like Weblo. I have a I have a cousin that's a, a Eagle Scout. Uh, that, you know what? That. We're brothers then. That's how far I went. I became a Weblo, and that was about it. I, I got involved with other stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I remember that first time we went, like, and did the overnight camps and stuff. And it was like, 
time slows down in nature. And just some about it just feels like home. And so I think me doing the nature walks when I, you know, fast forward when I was older, like me returning back to that. But I was walking uh, one day and on the trail and I was going on a different part of it. And I saw this guy like going across the street. I was like, where did this go? Like, Let me just see where it goes. And so I came to a crossroad where I go left or I go right. So I went right, and then it's like, God started talking to me. And he was like, look at the tree. You called in the like, head with the air. I like, what you want me to see with the tree? I was <laughs> like, well, the trees everywhere. Like, what you want me to see? Go oh, hug him. And then First of all, I remember man. it was a tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was a tree that fell. And, you know, a tree that falls, it kind of starts to decay and starts to die. He was like, go over to the tree. I'm like, what you want me to see about the tree? He was like, you know, touch you like, that's what I want you to do. I want you to catch people before they die to their purpose. And the tree was like representative of people, but it was representative of me because I was dying internally because I was doing something that didn't feel right for me anymore. Right. And it's interesting how you, you paid attention to, to the voice. And I think that this voice we all have. Right. Uh, right. And and some are in denial of it. Some listen to it a little bit. Others, like yourself, are more attentive to that connection and take that to a new level. Right. Where you yeah. have to be integrated into your life and you pay attention. Yeah. Because it was so. I'm going to share this. And I haven't really shared this on podcast before, but I, it all connect. So, awesome. Uh, backtrack a couple years before that and like in that situation I just said that was probably the clearest I ever heard God or how anybody frames it but before then I got a snapshot of that when I was counseling somebody it was this lady that came in and uh, her son had passed maybe like a year or so ago and she was still grieving. She's like, well, everybody wants me to move on, but I don't want to give up my connection with my son. You know, it's like, it's still taking me longer. I think she cared for him and she was there when he passed or whatever. And so we were talking and we were talking, like I could hear her son telling like, tell my mom I'm okay. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, okay, wait, no, that's not what I just heard. I you know, get truth, it. truth be told, that that's a just a phenomenal moment um and truth be told you know what the the label that science puts on that if you will necromancy mm -hmm. now that's supposed to be mm, not a good thing right right and yet here it's so natural and, and it comes from that place of just wanting to be there in helpful service to another so how right. could that possibly be wrong? Right. But for me, in the moment, I was like, okay. I'm trying to, like, val not validate in the sense, like, is it right or wrong? But oh, you're I'm probably like, trying to understand what the heck's going on. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. But then I'm like, okay, well, how do I frame this to give it to the mom that doesn't freak her out? Because I, I don't want to say, like, hey, your son talking to me, and he said, hey. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. I'm like, I didn't want to do that. Yeah, that's, like, that's an immediate cause for dismissal, right? Right, right. So she was, you know, she was upset. She was crying. And I was like, you know, the way I framed it, I said, well, the way you talk about your son, I know you loved him. He loved you. And I was like, just because it's not a physical connection doesn't mean you have to totally separate from him. Uh, and I'm like, I feel, I think I just did not like the feeling that I had in the moment because I could feel it like you could feel it in the room, but it was something that I had not really experienced in a counseling setting. And like I said, I don't know what it was about. Maybe it was her and just that connection she had with her son and that kind of made it available in the environment or just I was open to it. I don't know the whole mix of it. Well, I didn't is really it have possible that maybe you were just in love and service and you became vulnerable enough mm -hmm. and quiet because you didn't know how. Right. 
right? And and so you became kind of vacant. Your <laughs> your cup was empty, mm -hmm. right? And it was able to be filled in that place of vulnerability because you were open to it. Right, right. But in that moment, after she, I guess because I not just framed it right, but I honored it, um, it gave her something that she needed. And I think it gave her the sense that she could still have her son, even mm -hmm. though he wasn't here physically. And I think everybody else was trying to get her to move on and push her. And it's not that I didn't acknowledge like her moving on with her life, but it was you can still have your son along with the growth that you're going forward. Oh, absolutely. Me. You know, it, it's been my experience, as bizarre as, it, as this may sound, kind of weird. I love being weird. The physical attachments that we have to people in life transcend death and cause the grief, mm -hmm. right? Rather than understanding that that connection is still there even though there is no physical representation of it it's in your heart it's in your mind it's in your your soul right because you were connected and it doesn't have to leave now the the difference is that we pay too much attention to the outer life we live half inside and half outside let's just start there right and and so we get caught up in the outer life and forget about the inner one that's connected to everything yeah. And has no boundaries in that respect, right? Yeah. You can, you know, talk to your son, your grandma, your great grandparents, mother, father, whatever. And it's just as simple as imagining their face or even thinking about them and just talking to them. And, yeah. you know, people will get varied responses depending on how vulnerable they are and trying to answer their own conversation in, in their mind, right? You got to learn how to shut up. And yeah. listen, which yeah. you did so tell me more yeah so um as you were talking it, it made me think about so two two of the most important people in my life have passed uh my grandfather has been about almost 11 years since he passed my dad has been a year since he passed Ooh. and so dads are tough I, yeah know, and so that's been that's been a a new journey for me uh, one thing, I always seek meaning in everything. Hmm. Uh, and it's Good like, place to start. Right. It's like, what's the lesson? Because for me, I don't mind, you know, difficult times or pain. As long as I understand what the pain is for. Like, once I get to that, and, you know, you don't get that, like, immediately. But if you allow it to present itself, then it's like, Got it. That's why I went through that. Got it. It gives you the challenge to grow stronger. Right. And right. gain understanding by doing so. Right. Right. So for when my grandfather, it was like a push for me to get more involved at church and involved spiritually because that's what he was like a corner, like a pillar in our church. Mm -hmm. So after he passed, and I remember his funeral. It's like I've never been to a funeral where I was motivated because I heard all these people talk about my grandfather, like what he did and how he inspired him and motivated him, encouraged him. It's just like story after story. And, and I was looking around like, when did he do all this? Because he was just always with us, like me and my cousins and everybody else. I was like, when did he have time to do all this stuff with these other people? Because he was always around with us. And I, was, and I, and I remember after the funeral, I was like, I need to do better. Like, I, I, I really need to, you know, Step serve. Up. Yeah, I need to serve more. And so um, I really did a lot more in the church. Uh, and I was diligent in it. But also, I wanted other people to know about him. And so from that, and it came from a conversation me and my cousin had, about my grandfather and, and we were just talking about stuff he told us, like lessons that he shared with us. And they were different for each one of us. He's like, well, granddad used to tell me this. And I'm like, well, granddad used to tell me this. And I'm like, well, how? he didn't tell me that. You know, it was different. It was like <laughs> jealousy was, going on there, huh? Yeah, like he he knew us, but he always used to tell, talk to me about family. Like, take care of your family, all that kind well, of stuff. So a lot of stuff, yeah. He, yeah, so a lot of stuff he used to do, I picked up. So a lot of stuff he did in church, 
how he just made sure my grandmother was good. I took up that. And um, and from there, one thing he was big on, and that's why, like, me and my cousin, like, all of us got, like, degrees and all that kind of stuff because education was big. Like, we couldn't play, cut the TV on, anything to everybody got their homework done, like, every day. So that's one of the things I find missing in America today, and, and that's critical thinking, right? And you can't, the educational capacity that's there, the kids just, for whatever reason, don't take advantage of, and their parents don't encourage them. Maybe they weren't encouraged. Right. But we really have, a, a, that's like our, from a social standpoint, that's our national deficit. Yeah, yeah, and and, you know, having an expectation on it too because like it was an expectation not only you're gonna do your work you're gonna do it well <laughs> you know you're gonna do it you're gonna do, do it right yeah you're gonna do it well and um and that's one thing that stuck with us uh, all of us but i wanted to carry that forward so i started uh, a scholarship fund through our church to like give back to the kids that were graduating and get them scholarship money we we'll do like events every year for them and, you know, celebrate them, make sure that they know that people are seeing what they're doing and want to care. Them. Yeah, and care and care. Yeah, and village is raising the children. Right, right, right. And so I did that for a number of years while I was still here. And it was, it was a labor of love. I can say that <laughs> wasn't the easiest thing to do. Oh, but. Wow. But every year, just to see, you know, the parents enjoyed it, the kids enjoyed it, and it was something everybody looked forward to every year, which I was I was thankful for. Um, now, with my dad, that's still an ongoing journey, <laughs> journey, because uh, it's fresh, uh, and it's not that it was unexpected, because he was sick for a long time. Mm -hmm. I think it was just I wasn't expecting it to happen then. And then every time he had been in the hospital, I had been there. This was the only time I wasn't at the hospital. Oh man, yeah, that's tough. I, I know my it's. I'm coming up on ten years. Uh, Christmas Eve morning. Wow. And uh, I, uh, you know, was orphaned and adopted as a kid, so this was my adoptive father that I was really, really close to. And I think you know part of that's because we were both water signs. He was Piscean. I'm Cancer. And I just always felt him. He was always, always seemed to know when to pick up the phone and call me. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he passed, uh, he'd had Parkinson's, he'd gotten horrible with it, uh, wheelchair confined, got to the point where he could barely even talk. And he had told my mother, who had dementia, that he would not put her in an assisted living center as long as he could take care of her. So it got to the point where he couldn't. And mm -hmm. they finally went in. My sister talked him in to, to going in after he had an episode. And three weeks later, he was gone. He was like, okay, mom's safe. I'm out of here. Right. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize how connected I was. I was devastated. I thought, I knew it was coming. Mm -hmm. Right. And I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll be able to handle this man. It was tough. And, and so I can empathize with how that transition was for you, too, is the reason I said that. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's, it's been, so I, I, I'll tell you, like, the, I'm going to say that, well, yeah, I'll say it like this. It was a gift from it, but it wasn't what I was expecting. Uh, well, I didn't anticipate this gift <laughs> beforehand, but I did get this gift. So, um, after he passed, like, I have a sister. We didn't grow up together. Um, and we would just text, you know, on holidays, just say, hey, you know, you know, how you doing or whatever. But we never really I got a younger to sister you. like that, too. <laughs> and, and so, you know, we don't have the same mother. And she she's about, um, about eight, nine years older than me. Hmm. But at the funeral that was our time to reconnect and like i remember we were riding like in the limo and we were just doing stuff and, you know i was just looking at we were just talking i was like yeah this is my this is my sister so from there we really made it a point like look we're gonna have a relationship now 
after this and we're gonna really put effort to it so now every sunday me and my sister talk and what it's done for me is giving me something that i didn't have because i grew up as an only child and i always wanted a sibling hmm. and so it's like now i got a gift that i didn't know i needed but it came at the right time that i did need it so i had somebody to walk through the grief with that understood fully what i was going through and I didn't have to filter myself. And some days we get on the phone like, well, this week rough for you? Like, yeah, it was rough for me too. It's like, so we, we'll go through it. But just like what you were saying as far as like even, even dream stuff too, I, I've i had several dreams about my dad since then. Um, and that, that's been um, the one thing I had one about a month ago. And, you know, you wake up, you realize that, uh, like, man, this is the only way I can physically, like, see him, you know, now, is if it's through a dream, and it, it feels so real. I woke up, I'm like, oh, man, like, I'm back in reality. <laughs> you, right, know? Right, right, right. you know, yeah, and so it's like that bittersweet kind of feeling. It's like, it's not that he's gone, and I don't think about him, and we don't mention him in conversation. But the presence of him, I think that's the thing that sure. I miss the most. Oh, yeah, the physical side, because we're eternal beings, right? We're always available. We may, you know, have different personalities and different bodies across the timeline of whatever that is, right? And yet there's this, um, well, like you said, it, 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 it's kind of a disappointment when you wake up, right? Because you were there yeah. and it's like, oh, man. No, I've had a, a few happen with my dad as well. And and what was really impactful to me, the morning he died, I, I'm in Arizona, he was in Indiana. And I was standing in the kitchen and I felt him hug me. And I, I recognized his energy, right? Yeah. And, and man, I just, I became a sobbing invalid. Mm -hmm. at that point i was just so overcome by it and yet had hoped for it too right because yeah. i know how the inner worlds work and that there's some bleed over that occurs between the two mm -hmm. so to have that experience on a visceral level was just out of this world right and i could uh, couldn't contain myself with and yeah. the sobbing it wasn't a, from grief it was just the opposite Mm -hmm. it's amazing stuff have you had any of those kinds of things happen because i know just from what you're saying you're like teetering on the edge of those you know, you know <laughs> those worlds so in a sense you're yeah. kind of a bridge between the two so not in the sense of the like that hug and brace thing but when you said that it was a conversation that me and my sister had and you know, she had less contact with my dad than, than I did. So I had a lot more of those moments than she did. And I remember we were talking, she was like, I wish I could hear him, you know, I, I wish he would tell me, like, if he was proud of me or not or whatever. So, like, fast forward a week. That's a question you really need. Isn't that funny <laughs> how as sons we always want to make our parents proud? And even yeah. when we've done everything imaginable to do so, yeah. still wonder. Yeah, and 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 like for her, that's a question. Like for me, I've heard I heard it over and over again from him, but for her, she hadn't. So the next time we talked, she was like, "Guess what?" She was like, "I had a dream about dad," and he was like he was talking to her kids and all that kind of stuff and he was like you know i'm proud of you and i was like see I'm like you we just yeah. talked about it and he, and, you know, he said it to her but um for me i had a, a instant so i love a christmas story that's like my favorite christmas movie and, you know they did a, a new version that was on hbo max and it was, i think it came out like thanksgiving day or something like that so i woke up i was like well let me check it out and, you know, as you're going through that process, you don't know what's going to trigger you, what's going to, you know, cause sure. a reaction to you. Right. And yet you're so, open. Right, right. And so I started watching it. 
And you know, in the in the movie, Ralph it was little. Now Ralph had like his own family and all that. So it starts off with the dad dying. <laughs> it's like, oh great, you know. But it wasn't the fact that it was dad. It wasn't that bad. But it was parallel in that movie to me. Mm-hmm. So the mom in the movie uh, wanted him to write up something about his dad because he's a writer and he'd been trying to get his writing career off the ground. So he eventually like write up more like a story. His wife take the story, submit it to the newspaper. And so then it gets published in like this, this article in the newspaper about, about his dad. Well, that parallels me because last year what I did that helped me process my dad's death. So I wrote oh, yeah. like a story. And I got a blog. I put it on Medium, but I posted it on Facebook. So I used to take a lot of writing classes with this uh, lady that owns like a weekly paper here. So she saw it and like, hey, Tan, we should publish this. <laughs> so the article about my dad got published the same way. I was like, see, <laughs> see yeah. I don't know why yeah. you are. <laughs> right, so you paid attention, and you fl- you you did what you felt inspired to do. Right, your original intention was to honor your father in in some way. And being a writer, yeah. you gave you the opportunity to do so. And your sister says, "Yeah, let's do this." <laughs> that's <laughs> so it's like that's yeah, so, so it's like, and and what I didn't realize because I almost didn't post it because I wrote it. I was writing it like right after, but I didn't post it till almost the end of the year because I was like, well, everybody going through grief and yeah. I don't know, the holidays heavier for people. I'm like, I don't know. And it was like, God, like, you need to post it. And I was like, okay. And I got some. You need to get response. over yourself, right? Yeah. And I, res- I got some in the response from people like, you know, either they knew my dad or they were dealing with a pain that was like sick or whatever. And so, it's not a it's a story that I wish I didn't have right now, but I share it a lot because a lot of people are there. Um they've had that happen or it's about to happen to them. And that whole process of well, what does it look like after they're gone and how do you navigate that? I'm learning that um over time and like November was a whole gauntlet of anniversary dates because <laughs> like his death date was uh like november 5th his funeral was on my birthday which is november 13th ah scorpio eh yeah and ah. then then his I birthday thought you had some water in you because of the, the <laughs> flow of our conversation right? yeah <laughs> i love water so the 22nd was his birthday, and then we had Thanksgiving. So it was like four dates in November to navigate mm. uh, through. <clears throat> and I made it through, but it was, it was a rough day. Uh, and some days were better than others, but it's, yeah, it, the holiday, everything is, is different. Um, and so you're just trying to adjust to the new version of you, because the version of you before they were gone is different than after they're gone. It's kind of, and you don't want that version to be smaller. You want it to be bigger, right? Right, right, right. (laughs) And now, in in this process, all right. So, how do you um, navigate or help your counseling clients navigate through similar things? Do they? Are you able to fully open up and and be with them from those inner places and engage them to do so as well? Or do you find that there's a bit of resistance in that still? Well, for me, I haven't really been doing a lot of direct counseling work. And I've been trying to see what, how do I want to be present in, like, how do I want to define my work going forward? so i don't really want to do direct one-on-one work not that i can't do it it's you certainly got the qualification to do so yeah i do i do but it's i know the energy investment for me so since we kind of talking about energy and all that like i know i'm an empath 
Mm-hmm. So because I'm an empath, I feel in ways that other people don't really understand. And things absorb a lot of different energies. For a lot of my direct counseling career, I was working with people that had a lot of heavy issue, trauma, like sexual assault, all that. And so I'm like a sponge. I soak all that up. Um, And even if I do things like self-care or whatever, it takes a lot longer for me to get a lot of that off of me. Sure. Let me ask you about the process of that since you mentioned it, right? The getting off. So once you've observed, and I found this for me uh, as well, so this is why I'm asking the question. When you absorb that, what do you recognize in the process of navigating through it before you offer the feedback? So what I usually tell people, and that's why it's more self-care for me. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm not doing it because in order for me to really do what I do best, I have to step into somebody else's experience and then tell them how they feel back to them. Because a lot of it is they're not aware of their feelings or they can't put words to it. I think that's the most important part, right? It, you can't, it's hard to articulate feelings because they're, we haven't been taught the language in order to do so, first of all. Right, right. You know, back so, to the edu- education point. Yeah. So for me, it's like, if I step into this, then I know I'm losing some energy that is not going to come back from the person I'm working with. And if I continue to work with multiple people, then I'm not, I'm going to be at a deficit that I can't really balance back out <laughs> because you have to then do paperwork, you got all these other things around it. So for me, I want to think about it from like a creative standpoint or a teaching standpoint of how can I use story to teach things that would then give people tools so then I can kind of be at a place where I can continue to ba- keep myself balanced, uh, but also give things to people that they wouldn't necessarily, necessarily get in a traditional sense. Sure. Because, because it's, a, it's a population of people that need intensive counseling, but it's also a population of people that are not in that space, but they need something too. And it's a larger population of those everyday people just need skills of just how to deal with everyday life. And so I don't want to do it from a, a head place, which is like this is what the statistics say this. And, and not saying there's not room for that, but people connect to stories and what people have gone through and then how that's been applied and then the outcome of it. It's like, okay, you had this happen. You did this, whatever, you got a way to frame it. And for me, that's what I'm seeking more. Like, how can I do more of that? Whether it's writing or, you know, doing, a, I, I, you know, well, not I want to do a podcast. I am going to do a podcast. Because <laughs> everybody's been telling me, uh, they've been getting on me and fussing at me uh, that I haven't got mine off the ground. But I really want to tell other people's stories in a way that, it shows the value of everybody because all of us have a story and yes. people need to hear our story because they will understand it and relate to it more from us versus somebody that's like a celeb. Not saying that it's not value in celebrity stores or whatever, but people see people like me and you all the time, but they don't know the full story behind us. And then when they start to understand, like, but well, that makes sense. That's why you're doing what you're doing to say what you say or whatever. Right. Because y'all, it's all source material. So if I hadn't had the experiences I did, I won't be able to talk about what I talk about from a, a place of ease. I would be more like, how do I say this and how do I make right. it sound good? Well, you're it's coming like, from a much more empathic place, right? And, and in right. being able to and, and acknowledge our learning styles, right? We get, get visual, kinesthetic, and auditory. And so the storytelling, especially through podcasting, and I would encourage mm-hmm. you to do so, 
gives people an experience that they can relate to and they you know if they're visual learners they can have the imagination you know cranking and, and seeing all the stuff and they can if they're kinesthetic they can feel the emotions that you're describing and if they're auditory maybe you know they'll have this scenery that that's set up that, that they can relate to yeah. um, and i find that especially in writers good writers especially that that creates a, a an experience that people can actually um just become you know it, it, it's like they become it right mm -hmm. you step out of yourself and all of a sudden you're in this other world and, and writing and reading and and you know watching movies and things like that gives you the opportunity to do so and explore things you may not have had the opportunity to otherwise yeah because i, I didn't think we have good a, for you yeah I, I think we just have a, a series of visual snapshots mm -hmm. and so what I've learned is that's how I best frame things. If I can get a visual and then wrap a story around it, then it not only makes sense to me, it makes sense to the people that's listening to it, but it also gives them a cue. So when a certain event happens, they got the mental picture that can pop back up. Right. Versus, yeah, well, I remember somebody had that happen. So let's, you know, and it, it triggers, see, and this is the educational part, you know, where we had this, database of others experiences that relate to our own that we can reflect on and find our own way you know because it's never going to be the same as another however it does offer that support because you've got some information from which to draw mm -hmm. yeah and, and and i think that's what draws the connection it's like as i'm talking I'm talking about a specific experience that has a visual for you and then like, but you might connect to it a different way. Sure. But then you get to put your story on top of my story. <laughs> and so then it's like, you know, it's, a, it's like a cake, right? Yeah, it's like a tapestry. So we all weave together like this, you know, we all have a, our story connects to a greater story. And the more we tell it, then the more people can then connect and then put their story on top or be willing to share their story. Right. And, and for me, that's what I want to do more of now because I think that's what people need more of is not necessarily trying to fix themselves, but to understand what value their story has for them and for the people that they encounter. Because and the fixing takes place automatically because you have that opportunity to observe reflect um you have your own catharsis uh, you know writing for me and, and i've written a bunch of books and and a lot of them about my own personal experience so i've had those opportunities of catharsis <laughs> just can be amazing and you yeah. know whether it's writing or or listening those opportunities happen and the fact that you're you mentioned that you know everybody or not everybody many have this desire to absorb stories and and to reflect on stories and and to share their stories and they aren't necessarily encouraged to do so there seems to be a trend in that now especially with the the virtual space and the digital world it, it's much easier to do so what I find that, and especially now as executive director for the Live and Let Live Foundation and Global Peace Movement, telling stories about how we can work together, about collaborating, about cooperation, about how we've found our connections with each mm -hmm. other, and then talking about, we have, we have two principles, right? Mm -hmm. Live and let live. Mm -hmm. Be a good human. Don't be an aggressor. So the, the don't be aggressor side, that's a little tougher one because our ultimate goal is to remove all um, visages uh, of aggression in laws and legislation, right? So the countries can't choose to go to war, right? We make it illegal. Yeah. Duh. So <laughs> that's going to long term, right? <clears throat> Somebody's got to do it. The other side of it, being a human, being a good human, 
gives us the opportunity to share these stories, to gather, to talk about the aspirations of being a good human, how we can embody those, how can we share those, and how we can grow together. We even uh, incorporated a social enterprise component that gives people the opportunity. We turn volunteers into earners, right? Can't have peace and poverty. Mm -hmm. So we're flipping that notion and, and uh We've got a couple of beta versions in process now so that we can detail it to the point where it's almost idiot proof, right? Here's the script you follow. We're hand holding you from a distance, which is what you're talking about in telling the stories and being able to share your own special sauce with those that connect with you and are connected to you through this wonderful water that you have yeah and not it's all energetic it's vibratory so the frequencies are attracted to you that are similar that need to hear you right and and it's just like what you say with water and i always like to kind of frame stuff with water because you know when you're thirsty you kind of seek out water and you got to go to a place to get it mm-hmm and where I get my water and where you get your water might be two totally different things because what what you need replenished might not be the same thing I need replenished. So I right. thirst can be uh, But one thing you said too, and that's one thing I really been focusing on for myself is not how can I be a, a good person, how can I be a better human? Hmm. And I think those are two totally different things too. <laughs> because, right because, because we share a planet we essentially even though we have a lot of outer indicators that we're different mm -hmm. right we really aren't no we we, we really are and, but it but it's and i had this conversation with uh with my neighbor so he owns a, a tattoo shop so like my apartment is above him uh where i okay. stay and so we didn't have these like real cool conversations over the past couple of years. But if you see him, you see me, and you like, how y'all know each other? Like, because <laughs> people want to put that together. Uh, but what people have to realize is you miss important like nuggets and insight from people because they might not look like you, they might not come from where you come from, they might not have some of the same beliefs as you do. But if you open yourself up to expanding your, uh, not even your social circle, but your ability to connect with different types of people. Right, right. I, I participated in a bunch of different groups and, and there's this phrase, uh, two phrases that keep coming up, psychologically safe mm -hmm. and intellectually humble. Mm -hmm. The psychologically safe means that you feel safe enough to be vulnerable. Right. So right. there's just created spaces that's not everywhere. And it certainly isn't in public. Right? right. And then the intellectual humility side of it is being able to listen and connect with someone that's got a vastly different experience. Right. Other than you without judgment. Right. 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 And that's the big piece, too, because I think. We look at people and say, well, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't say things like that. But. That's not you. <laughs> you know, it's like right. different people. Like different yeah. And yeah. but I've learned so many things and I've seen so many pictures of the world because I connect to people, you know, locally, but I've also connected people virtually that's in different parts of the world. They got different um, uh, you know, not just what they do, but like their passions and what they really care about and all that and hearing these different stories. So I've become more informed and I've grown, not just from my own personal work, but the people I've connected with and the stories they've told me. And then they've connected things to me or they've inspired me to do more things or they gave me a different perspective on something that I didn't even know of. And they're like, oh, I never thought about that. Hmm, that's cool. You know, so right. for me, I think, Cause I'm a, I'm a lifelong learn. Like I love learning, but I don't, I don't want to go back to school. <laughs> I don't want, I don't want no more school. <laughs> but, school but, be curious, right? There are many right. who have not gone through the educational systems, and their curiosity has led them to really phenomenal 
places as a result. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. So I, I just want yeah. I do whether it's curious about life, about yourself, about your connection, you know, that curiosity will, as long as you have it, it will eventually lead you to that place. Mm -hmm. in my opinion, I, I could be wrong, but I think a, a strong curiosity brings you into a different perspective in life that gives you an opportunity to learn stuff that you never thought you would. Mm -hmm. right? and, and I think from my like changing how I perceive myself instead of trying to like, oh, well, let me inform myself so I can be more of an expert. I want to be more of a student. Like how do I, how can I remain a student in life? A student about myself, a student about other people, a student about the world. So I never feel like I have all the answers. I'm okay. Well, I'm you honest. ask questions, you know how to shut up, right? <laughs> That's the one thing that we've got problems with, right? We ask but, questions and then we want to answer them with the thinking we already have, mm -hmm. right? And, and that doesn't work. Because that's <laughs> otherwise we wouldn't have the questions. Uh, well, who was Einstein said you can't solve the problems with the same thinking that created them. So we got to learn how to be quiet. And that's where that pause and reflect opens you up to that inner voice you were talking about earlier, whether you call it God, guide, angel, ally, mm -hmm. it really doesn't matter. You know, there, there's thousands of names for it, of which we all may find agreement, but probably won't. Right. Yeah. And yet yeah. it comes from that same place of just pure energy uh, and uh, wanting to be helpful. Right. You yeah. ask a question, it's because you want to grow. Right. Right. And it so I wanna I wanna make I wanna mention this because you said it earlier and before I forget it. So before I moved, I quit my job, I quit my teaching job. So I taught between adjunct and faculty for like seven years mm. and i decided to quit <laughs> well not decided I, I i knew it was time for me to leave uh i was just trying to get i always try and get confirmation from god like okay i don't well, want they to say seven's quit. a perfect number so you were in a perfect order in that place right <laughs> yeah so i ended up quitting my job so after i quit what I would see every day, and it happened for months. I would see 11 11 every day. Hmm. So I would see it early. And then if I stayed up late, and it wasn't like me trying to force it, I would just look sure. up at 11 11, 11 11. And then it started being other numbers. So it might be triple one triple two triple three or whatever and so like all these repeating numbers the universe is built on math and science you know, <laughs> so, and it's connected so it's interesting how even these you know the serendipitous moments right where you're just your open consciousness your awareness mm -hmm. is attracted mm -hmm. and so there are these signs that you've opened yourself up to to be able to perceive first of all and just acknowledge that, yeah, they're signs. You don't necessarily know exactly what they mean. However, right. they mean at a simple level that there's a greater connection happening. Right. And so that was encouragement for me. Like, okay, I don't know how this is going to play out, but I'm on the right track. Like, right, I'm, right, on, right. I'm on the right track. And, and one thing I want to mention too about, you know, how do I, you know, process things or whatever. I try, and it started. Uh, when my dad was sick too, he had just got better and I just needed a break because I was pretty much a caretaker for a long time too. Mm -hmm. So I went to one of the state parks and did a solo retreat. So I took my journal, took my Bible, took a couple books and I just was, uh, I, I don't think the first time I had a cabin, but I was kind of like at a state park I just was by myself. I just let, you know, the people that need to know where I was know about, like, look, I won't be answering the phone or whatever. I'll let you know when I get there. And I'll let you know when I'm on. Yeah. And so I just, like, put my phone. I cut it off. I put on, like, do not disturb. I really didn't try and watch, watch a lot of TV or be on my phone. I just allow myself to do whatever I need to do, whether it was journal or if I needed to sleep or whatever. And so it's something that I try and do at least twice a year, I'm overdue 
for one, since I uh since I moved, it I haven't really had one in two years. And so I know I need to have one. So hopefully I'll be able to do one while I'm here in the house, at least for like a day or two. But that's like my reset button. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those answers that I seek or question that I have, they get answered when I do solo retreat. And it come fast. <laughs> it's just like, well, why did I, when I able to get these answers, but it's when you... Well, yeah, there's no distractions there. Right. Right? When right. you're in the everyday living experience, there are so many, and I don't want to say that they're distractions, and yet from the core level, they are. Right. 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 And you're paying attention to those. So you're you're not able to get to that place of, of quiet and stillness that you can by yourself. And sometimes it takes a little bit to get there. Yeah, it, it does. But it's every time I've done it, it's always been like at a shifting point or something, like a question that I need to answer or kind of like perspective or the courage to like make a decision that I need to make. And I've been putting off. So I know for me now it's okay. I've had, you know, a section of my life where it's all about achieving and I did that. I climbed the ladder. I did all the stuff I can pretty much do in counseling. Uh, but now it's like, okay, what's what's the like what's my life work? Um, and what does that look like for this next phase of my life? and starting to lay the groundwork for that. Because I know what I've done in the past, that was for you know particular people, for particular things and reasons. But this is a, is a not a broader, it's a deeper work. Mm -hmm. And I'm still, that's still coming to me. One piece that I think, I think the beginning of it is, is something that I've been wanting to do for a while, I've been researching our like genealogy, our family history for a while. So I really, really want to get to the point where I know exactly where we came from, like what country, all that. And then I want to go and meet my ancestors and be on our land and actually meet them and document it and write it and whatever. That, that's um, an amazing journey in and of itself. And I'm kind of envious. <laughs> right, but you know a little bit about me. I wasn't able to do that. It wasn't until, well, I got remarried in 2017, and my wife, my first Christmas present was an ancestry subscription. Mm -hmm. That was in 2017. 2019 in January, my half sister shows up, uh, biological half sister, <clears throat> which led me to my mother, and so we went and spent a week with her that summer. She's passed now two years ago. Um, and I was, I think I was the last item on her bucket list, right? She just had to make that connection. I have two other half, I've got a half sister four years older and a half brother four years younger. And the interesting thing about it is I, you, you want to talk about uh, miraculous events in, in one's life. I met my birth father here in Phoenix at a UFO conference in 1989 did not know it i even spent the weekend with him in prescott he invited me up we had had that kind of connection where and i don't know if he thought about it or not we didn't have that conversation and it wasn't until then that i found out oh gosh you know my desire of meeting my parents actually took place much earlier than i, I thought and there was another weird one so it made me feel that much more comfortable and and all the weirdness that I experienced. And yet it was short-lived because he passed in 2017. I was looking forward to reconnecting with him. So he passed the same year that I got the Ancestry subscription. So being able to, my, my point is being able to research your history and find your roots is really important. And yet, is it? Right? Yeah. On on that personal level, it's something, okay, I gotta trace my history. What about your future? Which you're yeah. talking about now is okay, you know, where's my life passions and my purpose leading me to? Well, I feel like I gotta go back in my history first to discover this 
stream of who I am and then go into the future with renewed whatever from that experience, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Because I, cause I think... I think the way I look at the past is a little different, but I think it's, and me and my cousin had this conversation too. It's like you get to a point where you feel like it's a piece missing and you don't, you can't really put your finger on it, but you know, it's like, it's something that I, some about me, I don't know. And I think the reason why it's come back up to me now is because I lost my dad. And so it's like, okay, I lost him him and not lost and like oh he's not around me but it's like okay it, it prompts me to do it more because one thing that I I was planning on doing before he passed was to sit down and have him tell me his story like I really didn't know a whole lot about him growing up so that's one thing I like I really wanted to just sit down with him before you know for his time and just ask him like how was it when you growing up and what did it and ask them those things because I, I didn't know those things and so I think maybe me going back and tracing the family stuff is like me wanting to kind of get that piece that I didn't get before he passed yeah. too yeah yeah for sure but I know it was for me um yeah. especially with the weird stuff that happened throughout my life I, I just always wondered is was there somebody in my lineage that had these kinds of things that I could possibly meet talk to get mm -hmm. some solace from right mm -hmm. because I felt so alone not necessarily abandoned because my life was rich right yeah. there was that part of me that was just alone and yep. couldn't find connection until I got older now that brings up another question that do you find that there are periods of maturation cycles, if you will, where, you know, as we get older, that we reflect more mm -hmm. and get more curious in, in other directions than we had when we were younger, because we didn't necessarily have the questions about them yet, because we didn't have an experience to provoke the question right yeah <clears throat> so do you find that something that is consistent in in um in how you've gone through the counseling realms and, and the reflections the conversations you had with clients as well as your relatives from from what you've talked about yeah i think for me you know purpose and career and all that has kind of been something that i've weaved through all of the work that i've done because i've done like um i worked at a career center before so i did a lot of career fairs and career coaching um then i did a lot of teaching uh other counselors or whatever trying to help them figure out like their style mm -hmm. and did a lot of community mental health so i did a lot of home visits and you know stuff in the schools and work with adolescents. Of course, being a, a water sign too did you find that as you were doing this, that you were reflecting on yourself quite a bit yeah. internally yeah. as well? Yeah, so I think for me, what I realized is at every stage, like whatever was going on with me, I then got clients that came with the same thing. So like when my grandfather passed, I had a lot of clients that had grief. When I work with the kids. Funny how the universe works that. No? <laughs> yeah. Like when I work with the kids, a lot of them had issues with their dad. Uh when I was counseling, not counseling, when I was teaching, I had a lot of students that had bosses that were like, oh, they worked in toxic work environments, which I worked in toxic work environments before. So I know how that is and how to navigate. So um I think now in my life. I'm at a point where it's like I've been serious <laughs> for a long span of my life. Uh, I've had to be a lot more mature than my age. And I'm to a point now in my life, I want to enjoy life. And I think you that's again, good. Right? Yeah. And, I, and I'm reverting back to the things that I kind of let go of, which is kind of like my, my creative side, the writing side, me wanting to travel and explore and meet people and all that. Because I was locked down, you know, in the pandemic for a while, I was pretty much a care 
Tagger for years. Um, and then I was in school for years too. So it's like either I was taking care of somebody in school, <laughs> working all the time. I'm like, I don't want that type of life now going forward. Not saying I, you know, I won't get busy or I won't have multiple things to do, but I want energizing work. I want things that feed me. That's interesting make you say that and, and more power to you for that. The pandemic gave all of us the opportunity to be still, to self-reflect, mm -hmm. to figure out what life's about or the next phase, because coming out of this life is going to be totally different. So why not make it the life that you desire mm -hmm. and that feels consistent with your inner child mm -hmm. right, as opposed to this prescriptive path right that, uh you know from a false narrative yeah so i totally um empathize with <laughs> what you're going through and i believe and that's part of the reason why i started this podcast yeah. is that i know others have, have gone through this they and are able to articulate their reflections just as you have Mm -hmm. in being able to share their stories and help others who are going through the same thing still yeah it, and yeah. it gives us all that sense of, of we are one big family yeah yeah right? one so world, yeah, so it, world right yeah so i think that's why what i realized being in their role of always thinking you have to be the person to help it makes you a lot less vulnerable because then you're like, oh, if I'm a therapist or I'm a professor or whatever, or I got people looking up to me or they're trying to emulate me. And so then I have to be a certain version of me. Right. You're in your head real thinking serious. about what you need yeah. to be as opposed to being in your heart and your gut and feeling your way through who you are. Right. Right. And so it was, you know, I still got some video clips from like when I was teaching and all that. And even when we was in school, like we were taught a certain way to talk and sit and whatever. Uh, you know, it's like a counselor, like sit and posture and how you right. talk and communicate in the words you say. And I got to the point where I realized that that was for a season, but that was a version of me that is not this me now. Mm -hmm. uh and so with that it was a relearning of okay well this no longer fits me. it's kind of like wild way compared to it's kind of like trying on clothes that don't fit anymore or it's like you look at like this don't i was wearing that back then i don't even like this this don't even feel right let me take <laughs> some more comfortable and i think that's what i've been doing over another days. face of tea right yeah, it, yeah, it's like I don't, it, I don't like because I, you know, if this was if you were interviewing me about five years ago, I probably would have had a dress shirt on. I would have, you know, I would have had a, a whole different look. But now, I'm more comfortable being me in every setting, yeah. Uh, yeah. and however that goes, I let it go. Uh, I don't really have a a script or exactly what I'm going to say when I get on. I just, you know, use I pray before I get on, like, okay, well, whatever you want me to say, I'm going to say well, it. I told you before, you know, we start out a couple questions. I have no idea where it's going to go. We're going to have some fun. <laughs> no, it just goes where it's supposed to go. So I, what I'm embracing, it, even though it's not the easiest thing, sometimes you get a little, uh, not scary, it's just unpredictable of what well i think are. fear enters in uh, to be yeah. honest right Let, yeah. let's be honest it, yeah. I, it yeah. does for me sometimes and, and yeah. it's unwarranted yeah right because it's yeah. self-created right and, uh it, you know in the inner world there is no fear and perfect yeah. love has no fear right? right so to come from that place uh, as a human being we're talking about growing into you mm -hmm. know the best human you can be that's a place of fearlessness and vulnerability that we all can as ascribe and aspire to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because 
because it's a it's a more like welcoming welcoming and kind of warmer versions of us i think when we try and like shrink down it it makes us a little more cold and more like shut off and more calculated in how we talk and what on it and so i just been learning to embrace it more and you know embrace the the possibilities and just how things happen like how i'm on here because i know you sent me the the invite i was like i don't even know how he got the, i don't even know how he saw a profile or something like i don't even know how that happened magic <laughs> uh, I, I pay attention and i follow the promptings right i never know it's just in there subtle uh sometimes they're they're a little more than subtle however mm -hmm. I know there's always something there and this has been just an amazing conversation. So in, in closing out, there's a, um, I want to know what kind of advice would you offer to others that might be listening to this to help them in their journey on a daily basis yeah. from moment to moment, as the case may be. So for me, this is kind of what I've embraced, especially now um, in the latter part of this year is I I don't have all the answers and I'm being okay with that. And whatever I thought my journey was, it's shifting and changed. And so for me, I was always looking for the destination. Like, okay, I have this much time and I'm, you know, getting this degree, getting this accomplishment, whatever. And I was so goal-oriented. And now I just realized I'm going to continuously be on this journey. It's always going to be a next thing, a next evolution, a next thing to grow into. And so I embrace, like, I'm not there yet, and I'm okay with that. And we all just not there. We still all trying to be better people. <laughs> we, we all, you know, had the best intentions sometime, and we slip up. Uh, or we might take one step and go two steps back. But that's how we learn. And so I think giving ourselves more grace to be human and not think that we have to be perfect and have it all together. Okay. Um, and I, I think that's the best message I can give to people is that you are where you're supposed to be. Uh, but also, this is not the end for you even if it's not the best scenario for you you still learning so once you learn what you need to learn the next path the next door or whatever will appear so awesome advice terrence and i love the tea right um <laughs> this has been an amazing conversation and i'm sure it's going to be one that our audience will enjoy it. I thank you so much for the opportunity and for being willing to say yes. Yeah, I, I appreciate the invite. I, I've enjoyed it. It's been a great conversation. Awesome. Thank you. And namaste and in la catch. Thanks for sticking with us for this episode of One World in a New World. I'm Zen Benefiel, your host. And I will see you next time.